Good morning. Uh, it's kind of awkward to be doing a presentation this way, but I appreciate the opportunity to do it and that Avner and Maria and others uh, have, have invited this. Um, the topic is obviously really important uh, and it's well defined and the speakers on the panel and beyond that, uh, all of you at the meeting uh, really are outstanding and so it's a little daunting to be uh, making such a presentation and also I regret uh, I can't be out there. I haven't been as systematic and thorough uh, in, in researching uh, issues related to, to norms uh, as others of you who are there. So what I'm going to do is only offer some, some not necessarily connected observations about uh, norms related to the potential use of nuclear weapons. And I'm going to make four points. They, they really are drawn from, in a sense, from being in the field a long time and observing uh, leaders in different states as they think about and talk about uh, the use of nuclear weapons. The, the first point I would make is that the issue really is about first use. Um, that's too often lost in general discussions about the nuclear taboo. Uh, Nina makes the point in her book, uh, but I think a lot of the subsequent discussions of the book or of the taboo in general kind of alight over the importance that we're talking about first use of nuclear weapons. And I think there's a related uh, point, which is that, at least to my mind, or as I would think about it, um, to the extent we talk about a taboo or a norm, there's both a utilitarian calculation and a normative belief uh, behind it, behind the taboo. Uh, and whether you talk about it as a taboo or a norm or an amoral realist tradition of non-use, that seems like an academic argument to me, or, or as Scott uh, Sagan and, and Daryl Press and, and uh, Valentino in the uh, American Political Science Review talk about it, talk, you know, social constructivist, uh, military utility or strategic interaction kind of schools of thought about this. Seems to me um, they're all at play. And similarly, uh, there, you know, there's kind of always a utilitarian as well as a normative dimension um, really to any uh, taboo. Uh, taboos don't mean that people don't think about doing the taboo thing. It's quite the opposite. Taboos exist precisely because the act is tempting and therefore needs to be prudentially repressed uh, by all moral, sci social, and psychological power uh, that taboos can muster. And in the nuclear case, it's that uh, first use is not unthinkable. And suggesting that first use is unthinkable is misleading. Rather, the notion of the taboo is to make the thinking about it as fleeting and prejudicially negative as possible. Uh, first use may cross the mind as a potential impulse, but the taboo makes you rule out the action immediately and not come back to it. Um, it, it does not, in my view anyway, it doesn't negate the normative dimension to acknowledge the utilitarian uh, thinking or the consequentialist thinking uh, is what creates taboos in the first place. Um, human beings created taboos against eating each other or having sex within uh, a family because doing either thing uh, creates trouble that's likely to reduce the probability of your passing along a healthy uh, uh, reproductions of, of your genes. It, there was a material basis for, for over time proscribing and creating the moral weight of taboos against uh, these, uh, these actions. And I think critics of the nuclear taboo or of the idea of a nuclear taboo tend to want to make morality uh, or moralism and values uh, uh, they want to take it out of the discussions of nuclear weapons and international security. Uh, they tend to favor hard-headed, force-to-force uh, -force calculations and, and, and kind of denigrate anything that might have a moral uh, 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 overtone to it. Um, but it seems to me that's a false and unnecessary opposition. Uh, why, why would we not just simply say 
that the physical destructiveness of nuclear weapons is why initiating nuclear war has become something like a taboo. And if there's a moral dimension to this, it's both produced and reinforced by the material effects of nuclear weapons. So it's both kind of a moral taboo as well as a consequentialist uh, imperative. Now the second point I would make is that the taboo or norm is not about nuclear weapons per se. Rather, nuclear weapons are about instantaneous mass destruction, and that is the action to be precluded. It's, it's instantaneous mass destruction. And so here the issue is conduct that unambiguously threatens whole nations. It, it enhances security to reinforce the nuclear first use taboo, but the campaign, and, and I'll talk more about this in the sense that the taboo is not um, automatically produced. You ha you, you, it, takes, it takes active effort in, in campaigning. It needs to go beyond uh, or deeper um, than, than focusing just on nuclear weapons. It has to get to the more fundamental objective of precluding threats to the existence of whole nations. For it is such threats uh, that could allow first use in circumstances of self-defense uh, when the very existence of the state is in jeopardy. Uh, this is basically, I'm paraphrasing here, the, the, the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, um, which didn't rule uh, that, that the use, first use of nuclear weapons would inherently um, violate international law because they had, uh, again, in a kind of narrowly argued or, or, or decided uh, opinion, uh, the idea that in self-defense when the existence of the state uh, is in jeopardy, uh, first use may be uh, permissible. And I think that reminds us or should remind us uh, that, that the nuclear element of the taboo focuses on uh, perhaps the most dramatic and instantaneous means of a kind of existential threat, but that the underlying uh, issue and prohibition and driver really uh, would be the threat uh, uh, to the existence of, of, uh, of a nation um, state. Another way to put this is, and I think this also anticipates some of the arguments um, against the idea of a taboo, is that um, the taboo does not mandate suicide. In fact, I don't know if there's any taboo that mandates uh, suicide. Rather, the idea of a taboo is, is it raises the threshold uh, of self-defense and seeks to preclude uh, aggression on an existential uh, scale. Um, I think that understanding the taboo in this way uh, may make inculcating it more feasible uh, than if it were seen as a seemingly absolute norm which some people then deride as saying, oh, so we'd have to commit suicide uh, rather than uh, be the first to use nuclear uh, weapons. And I think this way of thinking about it, it reinforces consequentialist arguments, um, which may be uh, strong motives uh, for creating something like a taboo. Um, and the argument would be, you know, that is, uh, you know, that except when facing an imminent threat of the destruction of the nation, the use of nuclear weapons should be precluded. It's out of bounds. And to reinforce this injunction uh, and the material interest behind it, um, don't threaten the existence of others. It seems to me that's what's going on, and sometimes that gets lost when we just talk about the nuclear uh, taboo. Uh, third point, uh, top elites are who really matter when thinking about and talking about the taboo. Um, the public, not so much. Uh, and here I think the article that, that Scott and, and, and Press and Valentino did provides a really good setup. So I want to quote a passage from that. They write, scholars who attribute uh, nuclear non-use to powerful norms clearly indicate that those norms are widely held. For example, Tannenwald describes the nuclear taboo as, quote, a widespread popular revulsion against nuclear weapons, end quote, and argues that, quote, Domestic public opinion was an important factor both in constraining U.S. leaders' resort to the use of nuclear weapons and in forming the taboo itself, end quote. Uh, the, Scott and his colleagues write, taboos in particular are so deeply rooted in a society's culture and psyche 
that it is difficult to imagine a contemporary taboo that would apply only to elites. Incest and cannibalism, for example, are considered unthinkable and trigger disgust across all social and political classes. Well, I have a couple uh, thoughts on that. One is um, my instinct, and Nina's there and she can correct this, is that neither she nor Tom Schelling uh, had a lot of data about public opinion uh, regarding the use of nuclear weapons, but they relied on assumptions that may or may not uh, be correct, and the surveying that Scott and his colleagues did uh, raises questions. Um, but I want to pick on, on, on the quote from, from Scott and his colleagues, too, because they talk about cannibalism, uh, you know, being widely shared uh, wi uh, in perspective. Well, I think cannibalism is not widely thought about at all or undertaken because food's widely available in most of the world that we're considering. Um, so cannibalism in, in, in the world where we're talking about things like nuclear taboos, um, you know, it happens when rugby players uh, have their plane crash in the Andeans, but otherwise uh, food tends to be available. Regarding incest, um, I, I think the data you know, increasingly suggests uh, that the incident of sexual abuse within families is much higher than, um, you know, A, that, 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 that uh, anybody could be comfortable with, but also that has been uh, assumed. It happens a lot more than we think, um, which is, again, to say that, you know, whether the taboo is widely shared, uh, you know, there are a, a lot of people who, uh, who violate it, and that's why we need a taboo. Um, so whether or not there's a wide public appreciation of a, of a nuclear taboo, um, what, what, we, what we need are uh, elite decision makers uh, who hold it or who understand um, in a sense and will try to inculcate it uh, thereafter. And so here I disagree with Scott and his co-authors when they write um, that there, quote, are strong reasons to believe that public opinion on nuclear weapons ought to affect the decisions of elites uh, whether or not to use them. I mean, I'd leave aside whether public opinion would affect the nuclear calculations of Russian, Chinese, and North Korean uh, leaders. And, I mean, as we see, for example, in Russia right now in the, in the kind of the euphoria and the support uh, uh, for the uh, annexation of uh, Crimea, um, it's fairly easy to manipulate um, public opinion on these things. So uh, to me, it's, it's much less consequential. But let's think about public opinion and the American uh, commander in chief in a nuclear crisis. More than in any other circumstance, the president would dismiss opinion regarding what she should do before she makes the decision. If she's in a nuclear crisis, and thinking about the first use of nuclear weapons, which would be so consequential, any president would recognize that would matter most to his or her position and future legacy would be what would happen after she pressed the button. If you told the president, Madam President, 70% of the people we polled think we should use nuclear weapons to drive Russian forces from, say, Estonia, I'm sure the president would say back to whoever, whichever advisor suggested that, said, yeah, and what will the poll say after I do that? What will the poll say after the Russians nuke our air base in Germany or destroy half the population of Tallinn? Don't tell me about the polls uh, now. Tell me about the polls uh, after. And, and so I would argue that pre-nuclear use public opinion, in other words, will be dramatically less relevant to any decision maker uh, than the post-use effects that they would predict. I mean, this reminds me also of, uh, of Robert McNamara um, used to uh, often say that he had talked to every president um, from Kennedy, and I, I, when he used to say this, it was, I think, in the Clinton administration, so Kennedy up to Clinton, and was convinced that each of them understood not to use nuclear weapons first. And in his mind, he was convinced that each of them uh, uh, wouldn't do it, regardless of what the declared doctrine is, and I would argue regardless of what they thought public uh, opinion was. Um, there are other examples when you talk to national security advisors, and, and the U.S. You know, may insist that it can't have any fewer than 3,000 
deploy nuclear weapons are now 1,500. But then if you sit around and, and, and ask them and you say, well, you know, if it came down to it, what do you think the decision to use would be? He said, well, maybe one is a demonstration shot. Um, so, and again, totally independent of, of public uh, opinion. A fourth uh, observation or, or point is that precisely because taboos and norms are socially constructed uh, and they restrain actions that are tempting, and because such taboos and norms are inculcated and maintained by elites, uh, their vi viability and durability requires constant promotion uh, in elite circles. There's nothing nat natural or automatic about them. And I wrote in this, this um, monograph I did last year, uh, Do One to Others, I researched the, the air war campaign in World War II, and, and I think it's a, a great example of this. So President Roosevelt, on his own, without reference to public opinion in 1939, uh, you know, created a norm and, and, and got an agreement uh, uh, you know, not to bomb uh, urban uh, populations, uh, uh, undefended cities. Um, got the Germans to agree, the Brits to agree, uh, and then we shortly broke that that norm. Uh, after, you know, shortly after the war uh, started, and again that decision was made uh, both to announce the norm was that without reference to public opinion, and then the decision to break the norm was made without consult consulting the public or public opinion. And indeed, Churchill and his government lied to the British public about what they were uh, doing in, in bombing cities because uh, they were trying to obscure it uh, from the public. But once that bombing started and, and the campaign was underway, there was no public uh, protest to it, and, and indeed there, there really wasn't uh, through the end of the war. So, I mean, in a sense it shows both how easy it is for politicians, political leaders to slip and to let the, the, the imperatives and the drive to, to win or to pound uh, the adversary, to slip off of norms. Um, but it also suggests that, that in, the, in the process, public opinion just uh, isn't, uh, uh, isn't very uh, important. And so it's, it's kind of the, the mindset of elites. There's new research out, a new book out on the strategic bombing in World War II, which suggests basically it didn't work. Um, and it seems to me, rather than simply prove the importance of consequentialist uh, arguments, um, insight from this, this episode of basically, you know, kind of wanton mass destruction, or, and Churchill talked about it in a private memo, um, you know, uh, uh, acts of terror uh, in, the, in the city bombing um, campaign, um, that, you know, we ought to be able to use that in a, in, in a way to inculcate the taboo against leaders today. So here you had mass destruction, uh, violating initially a, a, a norm, um, and, and doing out of, uh, being done out of consequentialist arguments that this will work, uh, but in fact it didn't work, in, in, in most of the uh, historical record would uh, suggest. And one of the reasons is um, when you begin wiping out people in large numbers, uh, their countrymen fight back. Uh, like they have, like they have nothing to lose. So, I guess the concluding thought I would have is that debating and promoting um, taboos or norms and the interests that lie behind them uh, is very important. And in, in doing this, we should focus first on the people uh, who are most likely to be responsible for state policies uh, in war and peace, and and in a sense not let uh, uninformed. Uh, broader public opinion uh, kind of undermine the the importance or the in, the perceived importance of at least uh, getting elites to understand um, why the taboo exists, which is both again has a moral dimension, but but fundamentally is a consequentialist uh, argument. Thanks, uh, and I look forward to being part of the discussion via the phone.